look at the uh, the arrow and the bow as relations to parents and children. Because in Psalms 127.4, we see it says, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Now you see, we've seen in the Bible where it talks about, Behold, children are uh, a gift from the Lord and they're fr a fruit of the womb. But we see right here in Psalms, it's saying that the children are a weapon. You know, God's not wrong in that aspect because they are a weapon. Your children are used. It's not that we use them as a weapon to go fight anything, but we use them, we're to train them to go out and to fight the good fight. Just like Paul did. Paul went out, he fought the good fight. It is our job to train them to go out and prepare them for the fight ahead of them because in the end, that is going to be the main thing is they will have to fight. They will. But tonight, we're going to look at it. We're going to go, and the title of this message is Crafting God's Arrows. And we look at that as, you know, because our children are God's arrows. You know, when we pass on, our legacy is what's left behind in our children. You know, did we raise them right? And how did we teach them? So we're going to look at the arrows first. And tonight, I want to pay attention to that because we look at the arrow. We start with the shaft. This is arrow making 101. The most common thing, the, mo the main portion of the arrow is the shaft. Everything attaches to the shaft. And when we look at it, this represents their identity. The shaft represents the identity. And you see, when we think about it, because you look at this, an arrow has to be perfectly straight to fly straight. Its identity has to be straight and true. But you see, when you start getting warps in it and you start using it so much, it starts bending and breaks and warps. So we have kids today that their parents that hasn't trained them and they're, they're warped. They're not going to fly straight. They're confused on how the world works. Because why? Their shaft is not straight. Their parents didn't raise them the way they should have been or they have you know, been neglected or they chose to go off on their own and rebel and therefore it caused the warp in the shaft. So it's not going to fly straight. But we also see the scripture records the story of God giving man and woman an identity. It says the nation of Israel was selected, adopted, and set apart by God to be his people. Every person is born with a unique, divinely imprinted identity. Each and every one of us were born with a unique identity. It's just like a fingerprint. No two are the same. Each and every one of us have one that's unique to just us. And that's how our identity was. When God created us, He created us in that uniqueness, that image. You know, we see we say the image of God, we're not talking about our physical makeup, but our inward makeup. How God created us. And we're unique in that fashion, but He wants us to be straight, just like this arrow, so that we fly straight and we fly true. But you see, another thing, too, that we overlook is the reason I decided to change it up this time, because last time I used my bow, this time I borrowed a bow, and this bow is more geared for precision. You see, the parents and even the elders in the church we have to be like this bow. We have to be precise. We have to be ready to raise them and teach them in a precise manner with precision so that when they go out into the world, they know what they're facing. They know exactly where they're going to be. They know their place in the world. That's where we come in. And that's our job. That was given to us. So we have to have precision in our lives as an example to them. We have to live a life that's that is straight and that is true and it has the identity to them. You see, we must also communicate with them. One of the most messages they will ever receive is you are made in the image of God and you are a valuable child. You think about it. What is the biggest killer in families, in relationships, even in churches, and a lot of things is what? Communication. No one talks. I mean, think about it. When is the last time 
we have had a big praise session where everybody got up and said stuff, a good praise report on Sunday. Nobody talks anymore. It's just like we all become catatonic the minute we walk into the church. It's the same way in the house. People are too busy playing on their phone and they're two feet away from each other and they're on their phones and they're not talking. You know, one kid may have a really bad day at school and he just needs mom and dad to give him a hug and tell him it's okay. But everybody's too busy watching the TV, too busy playing on their phone. No one's paying attention to the kid. That's why we have so many young teenage suicides today. It's because of that. You know, and that's one of the other reasons is social media has created that monster that kids look at that and they're cyber bullies. Do any of y'all as older parents, do y'all know how to handle being that? Do you know how to handle talking to a kid that's being bullied over the internet that they can't see? You need to, to go talk. You don't even know who the person is that's talking to them. We don't. But these kids, they go through so much more than we ever went through. When we went to school and you were bullied, it was person-to-person -person bullying. It wasn't nothing over cell phones or over text or over Facebook. It was like that. So these kids today, they they grow up with a confused identity. They don't know who they are. Some of them don't even, they grow up with a confused identity of what sex they are. Are they a boy or are they a girl? In California, they have a deal where every kid in the fourth grade, I think to the fifth grade, has to go through a gender neutral class to teach them they can be any gender. And that's in elementary now, where kids are most impressionable. But you see, that's the world we live in. And kids are weapons. They're God's arrows, they're God's weapons. We are to help refine them. We are to help keep them straight and keep them solid. You see, you can't, be, this arrow is solid. It's not going to break very easy. And that's how we have to be with our children. That shaft has to be straight. That shaft has to be true. Next thing we look at, you see, everything attaches to the shaft. Everything. So we go through the shaft, and then we come into the fletchings. Now, these right here are plastic fletchings. You know, sometimes the Native Americans, they actually use feathers and wood, wood arrows that they carved out of trees. But the arrow itself and the bow have been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It has been something that's been around for a long time. And one of the things that I was thinking about when I was writing this was the arrow. It's been around for thousands of years. And do you know it's still a work in progress? They are still tweaking it to get it faster, fly straighter and truer. It's still working on it because why? It's a constant work in progress. That's the same thing with us and the same thing with our children. Even when the children leave home, guess what? That's when they're going to need us the most. Because they're a work in progress and they're going to see and they're going to find out that life isn't what they thought it was going to be. So they're going to need help. And now we look at the feathers and the fletching, we see that why do you think they have these? Why do they have fletchings? Why do they have feathers? It's all part of the aerodynamics of it. It causes it to fly through the wind and helps keep it straight. If I was to shoot this without anything, it'd go, but it's not going to fly straight and true to where I want it, to where I need it to go to. You see, it's a, it stabilizes the boat. It helps stabilize the arrow as it flies. Because a lot of times when you look, if you watch an arrow flying in slow motion, you see how straight this is? Watch it fly in slow motion. You'll see it doing this. Because an arrow will rise and fall, and this will flex. It will. It'll flex. But because of what it's made of, that's part of it. The fletching is to help stabilize it as it's going through the air. And when these arrows are fired through the bows, I mean, some of these reach speeds are almost 400 miles per hour. I think, I'm not sure what this one's clocked at, but it's probably close to a little over 300. 
We see from Genesis to Revelation, character development is a major theme in God's work in His people. It's all about the character. You know, the character development. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation gives us everything we need to help refine our child. Because they are God's errors. God gives us the tools, gives us the knowledge we need to teach them, to guide them, to introduce them to Him, and He takes it from there and He refines them. He becomes the main one in their lives when they accept Him, and He refines them through, like we talked about Sunday, He refines them through storms. Through the storm, through the fires of life, they're, they're forged. They're stronger. Now, they're not just made out of something just cheap, but they're forced through their faith. They're strengthened up. And that's what we keep the feathers for because you think about it, they're stabilizers. What is there going to be our children's stabilizer in this world today? When they get out in the world today, they're going to need their faith. Because I'm telling you right now, <clears throat> their faith is what's going to help hold them true. It's going to hold them strong. I've talked to guys that were POWs. I've talked to guys that had been shot down in different wars and different things, and they told me behind enemy lines, one of the things that kept them, true, kept them strong was their faith because it gave them hope, and hope is a powerful weapon. But you see, that's what we got to give our kids. You know, I can't give my kids that there's going to be hope for a better world because this world is not going to get any better. But I can give them hope for a better life after this world. By putting their faith in God. They're going to have a better, they're going to live in a better world. They're going to have a better life. They're going to be in heaven with the rest of us because of where their faith lies. You see, we look at it like that. We have to make sure their identity is good, they're, sh they're straight, their character's developed, and they're stabilized through the Word of God because that is our responsibility. Now we look at the knock. All right, knock right here. Is the knot. This is the portion that clips onto the bow, the bowstring. It has one of the most crucial points. If you think about it, without the knot, this arrow is not going to fly. It's not going to mount on. But all the pin up, it says all the pin up power in a bow is no value if it cannot be affected and transferred. That's why every arrow at the rear of the shaft has a small groove. And the knot can be compared to the third core ingredient necessary in a child's life, relationships. The relationship. You see, one of the things, this arrow is not going to fly without the knock. It's not going to go anywhere. A child is not going to go anywhere without the true relationship. The shaft and the knock have to be one. You see, it has to be one. You cannot take this, this should not have to be coming off where it's constantly falling off because then what? Your relationship is, has a break in it. The knock has to stay true. It has to stay strong. It has to be on there so that when it's time to fire, this right here is ready. That relationship with your family, with your children, with your grandchildren, all of that plays in part because of that relationship with your family is only as strong as your faith. You think about it, if your family, if I had to put your family in the end of this arrow and fire it, would your knot be tight or would it be loose? Remember, we've only been strong with our weakest link. So we think about it, what's the weakest thing in our family? Is witnessing. You know, that's one of the hardest things is witnessing. We see about the relationships, children are going to need parents. They're going to need them. People say, you know, kids say all the time, I don't need my parents. I don't need them. But they do. You know why? They need to feel loved. They need to feel wanted. And there's a great example in the Bible, and I love it, it's when, you know, the, the lady that had that bleeding disease for most of her life was an outcast because during that time most of the women, they were sent out of the camp their time was up and then they had to stay longer until they were clean and then they were allowed back but guess what she was never allowed back she was outcasted 
But when she touched Jesus' robe, what did he say? He said, daughter. The reason why he said that is because she needed to feel loved. She needed to feel, she needed to feel like she belonged to someone. And that's what he gave her. He gave her that longing that every kid needs to feel. You know, I have talked to kids that, that have had abandoned. I've talked to kids that have had their, both their parents commit suicide. I've met different types of kids, and each and every one of them come down to the same thing. They can rebel all they want, but it goes back to one simple problem. They just want to be loved by their parents. They just want to be accepted. And, and that's the hardest thing in the world today. There's so many different things out there for kids to get into that they they try to rebel. They don't want to be accepted as this or that. They want to be accepted in their own way. Well, here's the deal. God created you as a man. He created you as a boy. And he created you as a woman. Yeah. When you decide to take charge and decide to change the nature of that and change your own life, you have crossed the line of where God intended you to be. You've changed your identity, not God. You have taken God out of the picture, and then you want us to accept you. Well, that's hard for parents, and I've talked with parents about that before, and it's hard for them to get to that point. You know, you still have to love the child. You pray for the child, you love the child. You may not agree with it, but you still love that child, and you help raise that child and teach them the right way, God's way, what the book says, not what man says. Because relationships, of course, to man, they don't mean anything. They're not important. And the world will tell you that you can live, live together, and it's okay, and not be married. And that's one of the things that a lot of people fight. You know? But that relationship with your children has to be strong because when they leave home when my two kids leave home I have to know that I have done everything in my power to prepare them to walk out on their own when AP over there walks out and she goes to school to try to be a, a veterinarian for whatever she's going to be I got to let her go and that's going to be in another state it probably won't be here anymore close and, but I have to trust that Alyssa's going to make the right decision I have to know I've done everything in my power to give her all the training she needs so that her faith can stabilize her. So that when she's out there and all her friends are doing something stupid, that little conscience in the back of her head kicks in and says, you shouldn't do that. You know? And you know, mom did that to me. She raised me right. And I had that conscience several times kick in. And not all I did, I always, I always didn't listen to it, but it was there. But... It comes down to relationships. So you see, we had the shaft, which was the, the main body of the child, their identity. The fletching, which stabilized them. The knock, which was your relationship with them. And finally, you have the point. You have the point. Now, this is a target point because I'm shooting it out of the target. But there are many types of points out there for arrows. And the point dictates the mission. The point dictates the mission of the arrow. What is it used for? Right now, this arrow is used for targeting, for target practice, because of the type of point I have on it. If I was to take this point off and put it a broad, put a broadhead point on it, this arrow now becomes used for hunting, for hunting the game and wild animals. So, what is the point of your child? Is your child's point finally crafted? Is it complete? You see, each one of these points, you're not going to find a dull point. These points have to be shaped just right. Everything about this arrow has to be balanced out. You start thinking about it, the weight of the tip, the weight of the fletching, the way you got the fletching glued on there. Even the fletching, if you look at it, right, actually sets at a certain pitch. It sets at a certain angle. It don't sit straight. It has a little angle to it to where to help it spin through the air. Everything about it is unique. No two arrows are alike because of the difference in them. You know, they're all similar, but when you get down to the fine details, this point is smaller than this point. The weight, this point has more weight in it than this point. But you see, each one of them were different in their own in their own in their own identity. 
So when we look at that, the point, what is the point of our children? What do we want our children to be? You see, every child should be helped to understand that life is a dynamic relationship with God that overflows in love to other people. A love that the Holy Spirit uses to reconcile the loss to God. The point of our raising our children is to love. It's all about love. Because what is life without love? And that's the main thing we look at, you see, we've gone through life, and a lot of us have seen our lives and what it was like before we were saved. We can look back at our past and see that there's a lot of times that we were not very lovingly to people. We didn't act the way we should have to people. And when we look at that and how we raise our kids, do we want our kids to be more lovingly, or do we want them to be like we used to be? No, we don't. We want them... We, one of the most common things for parents is we want our kids to have a better life than we did growing up. We want them to be better than we were. We want them to do more, to achieve more than we do. Sometimes we get too overzealous and we try to push them too much and we end up pushing them too far and that's where rebellion kicks in because the kids are going to fight. When you tell a child not to do something, it's going to create a want to do it more. Because there's somebody told him not to. It's just like an adult. And you tell me not to do something, I'm going to wonder why I'm not to do it. And then I'm going to wonder, well, can I do it? But you see, that point has to be the mission that God has set forth for that child. And that can only come through love. That can only come from us showing them the love of the Father, the love of God, and how we we sit there and send them out into the world. But you see, when we look at it, when kids are grown up and we send them out, we have to prepare them for what's going out because eventually they have to go. They do. They eventually, they're going to leave home and they're going to go out, but are we going to help them hit the mark? Or are they going to are they going to land where they need to land? Are they going to go where they need to go? All of that is because of how we raised them. Did we raise them right? Did we set them on the right path? Did we give them all the tools that they needed to be successful in life? Because when you think about it, when it comes down to it, that child is only as strong as you made them. And they're only going to fly straight as you have taught them. And they're only going to hit the mark if you send them in the right direction. All of that is based off of us. We have to be that precise boat. We have to have all the tools in our lives as an example to sh tell them, to show them, so that when we send them, they're going to go straight, they're going to go true. Because there's three things in common to this message that you can you can bank on. They have to be shaped. That arrow has to be shaped. It has to be sharpened. And it has to be sent. All, all of that can only happen by godly parents that are willing to send their kids where they need to go. And it helped them find their way. But you see, eventually we'll miss them. They're going to make a mistake. And they're going to miss the mark. But that's where we come in there and we help them find their way back home. Only, only through the Word of God can we help our kids see where they need to be. Only that way. There's no other way. There's no other way under under man that can help these kids. That can help our kids or even our community kids that are not our kids. Only God can. From Genesis to Revelation, everything is in there that we need to shape them. Shape them. You know, God said in Genesis, let us make man. When he said let us, he was talking about the Trinity. For the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were right there when God said, let us make man in our image. 
Our children are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. How are we reflecting that image? You know, are we showing our kids so that when we send them to their, their destiny in life, are they going to find, hit the mark? Or are they going to go off because we didn't send them properly? We didn't raise them properly. We didn't shape them properly. They're shaped in the image of God. We had to help. You know, we've always seen God as the potter and we're the clay. But guess what? The parents or the help. God has sent us to help mold these kids physically here on earth to help show them the way, to guide them. We're their guides. And that's how we have to be. We have to guide them so that they're shaped. We have to sharpen them. The only way you're going to sharpen a child is through the Word of God. Iron sharpens iron. Think about it. I can't sharpen a knife by rubbing it in the grass. It's not going to work. It'll dull it. But it will not sharpen it. Only through iron and through stone can I sharpen a knife. Only through the Word of God can I sharpen a child. Can I shape him? Can I get him dialed in to where when he goes and he goes on his own, he hits the mark where he needs to be? Only through the Word of God can I send that child out and have faith to give me peace at night to sleep knowing that God has got my children. My grandfather told me a story one time that he had a dream that all his, you know, that Mama Billy and his kids were, were drowning. And he just, you know, my grandfather had the fear of water a lot. And he said that that moment he knew he had to get up and go give him back to God. He had to give his family back to God. And that's the thing, that's one of the hardest things is I had to take my family one night and sit out in my yard and I, and I sit out in my yard and I pray. I had to give them back. I am here to physically protect them on this earth and to physically help guide them. But ultimately, God's got them right now. I have to trust that when they go on their own, God's in control. He's in charge. Only through God can I send them out and know they're going to go right where they need to go. Because God is in their mind. And they're letting Him take control. They're not letting Him take back seat. And that's how we as parents have to be. We have to live a life to where we show our kids that God's in control of our life. And that's even with everything from the way we talk to each other, the way we hold each other's hands, the way we talk, you know, we kiss each other. It even goes into our intimate life. As parents, that goes into our intimate life when we bring God into everything. Everything changes. But you see, we have to do that so that when our kids look at us, they see that. You know, if our kids look at us and see mom and daddy sitting on opposite sides of the living room, both of them on their phone and not talking to each other, what message is that sending them? And mom and daddy don't love each other. Mom and daddy don't want to talk to each other. Because they don't want to sit at the dinner table. And, you know, when's the last time the families just sit at the dinner table together? And... When's the last time everybody said, turn all the electronics off in the house and let's play a board game? Family time. There has to be family time. One of the last pieces of advice Brother Jerry gave to me before I took on the ministry was he said, God called you to take care of the church. He didn't call you to sacrifice your family. He said, the church comes second. Your family is always going to come first. He called you to preach the word, but not at the cost of your family. And that's hit home. And so a lot of things, a lot of the time I've done things has been to gear my message toward myself. A lot of my messages, 99.9% of my messages that I preach are preached to me. They're for me. Not for y'all as much as they are for me. Because I have to live this. This message I'm preaching tonight, I have to live this message and preach it to my kids. I have to be that example. Not just as a father, but as a pastor. I had to be that same example for y'all as well. And that's how we have to be. You know, you're, you may not, your kids may be grown and moved out, but guess what? They still look to you. They still look up to you. They still see you as that, that figure in their life that they can lean on when they need your help. You know, they call mom and dad when they're down, depressed. I know I've leaned on mom a lot when I have those moments, you know. 
and we know kids know where to go to and as parents our job is to be there no matter the cost be there you know I love my dad to death and I watched my dad work off work off his entire my entire life to provide for our family and I have the utmost respect for him for that but at the same time, I watched my dad walk off a job that he had held for over 20 plus years when my kids were born. He said, I'm not going to miss a moment of that life. He walked off the job and came home because he said, I'm going to be there for my grandkids. I wasn't there all the time for my kids, but I will be there for my grandkids. And that literally broke me down in tears because he did that. I knew what he sacrificed. I knew what he was about to go into with no uncertainty of what was about to happen. But he knew he needed to be there for my kids, to help shape my kids, to help sharpen my kids. And you think about it, it's not just a parent that's going to do it. It's an entire family that helps shape these kids. You know, when we were growing up, we were raised by a mom in the community. I mean, the community, we were all over the place. But you see, that's how it was. Your community, your extended family, your family helps raise your children. Everybody has a piece. Just because this kid may not belong to me doesn't mean I can't have some influence on them. You know, I had 15 archers on my team that we took to national. One of the things I did before every tournament was we came to huddle and we prayed. Not every one of them kids went to church, their parents went to the church, but they knew that before every meet, we were going to pray. And that's an influence on them. That's how we do it. We help them, we guide them, we show them. We don't force it, but we help show them. And we have chisel away a little bit of time. It's just like when you're whittling wood. You, you slowly whittle it till you get to a shape. And it takes time. It's not going to happen immediately. It takes time. But we have to be patient with it. So when we get down to the end of this, we see that because the arrows are what they are, they have to have those main components to fly straight. They have to have the shaft, the flexion, the knot, the point. All of that has to be in place. Like this there right here, it's missing a point and it's missing a flexion. It has no mission. It has no purpose in life right now. It can't do anything. It can't fly. It can't do nothing because it's not going to fly true and it's not going to stick in anything. sit there and find a way to tear them down by taking pieces off, by tearing parts off one at a time. And I'm telling you right now, one of the first parts that is taken out of a child quicker than anything is their faith. Their faith. And I, you know, a lot of it goes down to, well, mom and daddy fought like cats and dogs and Sunday morning they were the best Christians in the world. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy will turn a child away quicker than anything. The church. The church judged me and said that I, I, I didn't belong there because I had a divorce. I had this going on in my life or I stole something. I got in trouble and they didn't want me there anymore. Listen, y'all, I've heard them all. You know, this, this community right here in Seaford, this church in the past, has burned so many people in this community that it is a generational type of grudge that my grandfather got hurt when he was in here. Somebody hurt my grandfather's feelings, so I'm not going to go. they never even been to the church. But because their grandfather, their dad, their mom, or their brother, or somebody got hurt, a generation grudge is still out there. It's our job as representatives of God and of Dixie to go out there and show them this is not what it, this church is not what it used to be. We're a loving church. We're here to help. We're here to love you. We're not here to pass judgment or condemnation on no one. We cannot look at people with eyes of condemnation. We can't. We have to look at people with eyes of love. And that's the only way, the only way we're going to be able to have our kids successful in life is if we show them what it means to love.